Assalamu alaikum dear students. Uh, students, we have been talking about confronting marginalization, which is the eighth chapter of political science book of class eighth. And in the previous video, in the previous lecture, we talked about how marginalized groups invoke fundamental rights to protect their rights, to protect their interests, to advance their interests. And we also talked about uh, the laws that are there for the promotion of the interests of the marginalized groups. Uh, we, talk, there, no, we talked about the policies like reservation and other schemes uh, which are there for the betterment and the upliftment of the weaker sections of the society. And in this section, we are going to talk about the protecting the rights of Dalits and Adivasis. So in this, actually, we'll be talking about scheduled caste and scheduled tribes, Prevention of Atrocities Act 1989, and then we'll be talking about Adivasi Demands and 1989 Act. <clears throat> okay, students, now coming to the this first topic that we are dealing with uh, is uh, protecting the rights of Dalits and Adivasis, Scheduled Castes and uh, Scheduled Tribes Prevention of Atrocities Act 1989. So uh, students, apart from the uh, schemes that the central government or the state governments devise for the betterment and the upliftment of the underprivileged sections of the society, so uh, this is not the only way in which the government takes action. So government has made and, and will inshallah in future make certain policies that will uh, actually further the in, uh, no, interests of the weaker sections of the society. So government has already taken certain steps. And it has already uh, made certain specific, specific laws for the weaker sections of the society. So. One such law is this Scheduled Caste and Scheduled Tribes Prevention of Atrocities Act 1989. So before I talk about this act, what this act contains, what is it all about, okay, I would like to tell you a story. This story is also mentioned in your uh, you know, textbook in the same chapter, Confronting Marginalization. The story is about a village called Jakmalgur. Uh, where a big festival is organized every five years, and the event is organized to honor the local deity, and the priests from neighboring 20 villages come for this event. However, the ceremony begins with, the, with a you know, Dalit man, with a Dalit uh, you know, a caste member, washing the feet of all the priests, and then using the same water to bath, you know, he, he has to then, you know, take bath in the water used for washing uh, the feet of all the priestess. You know, in Jakmalgur, it used to be the Ratnam's family who used to perform this custom of washing feet. You know, before him, it was uh, his father who used to perform this custom, you know, uh, and his grandfather also performed this, had also performed this custom. Now it was the Ratnam's turn to wash the feet of the, you know, priestess. And this Ratnam was a 20-year-old boy who studied in engineering in nearby college. But this boy, Ratnam, outrightly refused to perform this custom of washing feet, saying that he did not have faith in this custom. He did not believe in any of such you know, rituals. He also said that his father or his, his other family members were forced to perform this you know, custom because they were Dalits. And this angered the you know, powerful castes, the upper castes in his village, and some families of his own caste also felt angry uh, because they were, you know, they, they were shocked to see these powerful castes especially. Uh, they were uh, shocked to see this behavior of, of Ratnam that he refused to perform this custom, this practice, this ritual of washing the feet of the priestess. And then it was also declared uh, that the local deity, the wrath of the local deity would strike the scheduled castes if they don't, if they didn't uh, perform this ritual, if they didn't 
you know, perform this custom. But uh, Ratnam would argue, saying that since no scheduled caste had ever entered temple, how could uh, they, how could uh, deity be angry with them? So he had a point. And next, you know, uh, his uh, you know, families, his people from, you know, belonging to his own caste also were fearful of supporting him, supporting Ratnam, because uh, they used to they, uh, they used to work on the fields of the powerful castes. They felt fearful because uh, they feared that uh, they would not be, uh, they would be deprived of the source of livelihood if they supported Ratnam. And finally, uh, what happened that these powerful castes, you know, they decided to uh, teach Ratnam a lesson. What did they do? They, act, uh, they told his community not to, uh, not, not to cooperate with him, to ostracize him, to boycott him. And everyone in the village was told not to speak to the Ratnam, to his family. And one day, what happened? His heart was set ablaze. His heart was burned down. He, however, you know, was successful in escaping along with his uh, mother. And then, you know, Ratnam, filed a case in the police station under this act, Scheduled Caste and Scheduled Tribes Prevention of Atrocities Act. And the local media also picked up this story. And Ratnam became, overnight Ratnam became a symbol of the Dalit action. And finally, uh, this custom was called off. So it was a success, it was Ratnam's success that this custom was called off, this custom, this practice was called off. Okay, uh, now talking about what this uh, no, right, what, what this act is, Scheduled Caste and Scheduled Tribes Prevention of Atrocities Act. Let's talk about this act now. Because in case of Ratnam, we saw how he used this act to uh, do away with that you know, humiliating practice of washing feet. And let's talk about this act so as far as this act is concerned, the act Scheduled Caste, Scheduled Tribes, Prevention of Atrocities Act 1989, this act is also known as Atrocity Act. So as far as the, uh, this Atrocity Act is concerned, it lists the different crimes, the different modes of the humiliation. It does three important things. The act does three important things. One, it lists it list us the modes of humiliation. It, and seeks to punish anyone, or seeks to punish those who force a member of scheduled caste or scheduled tribe to consume any obnoxious substance. So, any obnoxious substance. So anyone who forced any scheduled caste or scheduled tribe member to consume any obnoxious substance, so that person is to, uh, will be punished under this act, which is called the Scheduled Caste and Scheduled Tribes Prevention of Atrocities Act 1989. And besides, it also punishes anyone who removes, who forcibly removes clothes of a scheduled caste or scheduled tribe member or parades him or her naked or does anything violative of human dignity. So this is the first thing. First, it lists the modes of humiliation and seeks to punish those who actually force any scheduled caste or scheduled tribe member uh, to consume any obnoxious substance or uh, you know, who forcibly remove uh, the clothes of a scheduled caste or scheduled tribe member, as I said earlier, or you know, parades him or her naked or does anything that's violative of human dignity. And the second thing this act does is that it lists the actions of the actions that dispossess the scheduled caste or scheduled tribe member. The second thing it does that it lists 
actions that disposes the that disposes the member member of scheduled caste or scheduled tribe of their meager resources of their meager resources so for example if uh, anyone wrongfully occupies or you know occupies or cultivates any piece of land uh, owned by scheduled caste or scheduled tribe member he or she will be punished under this act scheduled caste and scheduled tribes prevention of atrocities act 1989 okay uh, the third thing it does is that it recognizes that the it recognizes that the crime against scheduled caste or scheduled tribe women is of special kind is of specific kind is of specific is of specific kind and seeks to punish those so uh, let me tell you the third point that this act does is that it recognizes that the crime against scheduled caste or scheduled tribe women is of specific kind and seeks to punish anyone who uh, forces uh, the women belonging to scheduled caste or scheduled tribe with an intent to dishonor her so we are done with so with this we are done with this protecting the rights of dalits and adivasi this was all about uh, this uh, act uh, scheduled caste and scheduled tribes prevention of atrocities act 1989 now we'll move to the other topic the second topic rather that is the last topic of the chapter and that is adivasi demands and 1989 a adivasi demands and 1989 act when i say 1989 act it uh, means it automatically means the scheduled caste and scheduled tribe prevention of atrocities act 1989 so uh, adivasis you know there uh, this act 1989 is important for another reason as well uh, because uh, you know uh, many adivasi activists Uh, refer to this act to defend their right to occupy land which was originally theirs which was traditionally theirs many you know uh, in most cases adivasis were forcibly thrown out of their land they were forcibly displaced from their uh, land and uh, and these are these uh, activists argue they point out that those who have forcibly encroached upon the lands of the adivasis should be punished under this 1989 act which is the atrocity act they should be punished under this uh, act and uh, one of the prominent one of the prominent uh, adivasi activist called ck janu ck janu she pointed out that one of the violators of the constitutional rights of the adivasis uh, have been has been the governments the state governments themselves because it is they who allow the uh, you know non tribal encroachers as in the form of the uh, in uh, timber merchants in the form of the uh, paper mills etc to encroach upon the lands of the adivasis and besides uh she also pointed out that in cases where adivasis have already been evicted and they cannot go back to their lands in such cases these uh, those who have been displaced should be given uh, you know compensation after all uh, these states actually spend huge amount of money on building 
uh, you know, these industries on building the factories and other development projects. So why should they be reluctant uh, uh, in spending you know, modest amounts on the rehabilitation of these uh, displaced Adivasis? So with this, we are done with this chapter, Confronting Marginalization.